happily sign it for you. So thank you again for joining us, and please welcome to the Main Voices Live stage, Ray and Paul. Thanks, Lisa. Ray, thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you, everybody, for coming here. And I want to thank Paul, especially, for coming here and talking to us uh, this evening. And uh, I just wanted to get sort of right into it, I guess, in okay. terms of, <laughs> in terms of uh, Paul's a writer. And we've been talking about what he writes about, obviously, about the, the Maine Woods. But I want to know sort of when you first knew you were going to be a writer, because I think a lot of people sort of try and a lot of people hope. But when did you, when did you know and, and what what made you want to be a writer? Uh, I know exactly. It was the day after I finished reading The Hobbit for the first time when I was around, I, I think I was around 11 years old, 12 years old, and I just remember being gripped by this feeling that I wanted to make other people feel the way that I was feeling in that moment, having finished that book and just being like transported to you know, the well to Middle Earth, uh, but. Um, and and did you see yourself writing that kind of writing fantasy? Or? Initially, yeah. I mean, I, you know, 12 years old, what do you think? Uh, <laughs> it it yeah. wasn't romantic suspense, I'll tell you that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you know, and, and I had very supportive parents who who always encouraged their kids in what we wanted to do. And uh, they, at one point, they bought me a Royal typewriter, which I still own, manual typewriter. I don't use it, but um, I did. Um, sort of graduated to an electric and then word processor, and I've been with an Apple for a long, long time. Do you ever go back to the typewriter just for nostalgia or <laughs> no. for fun? I'm, I'm a nostalgic person, but not that nostalgic. So at what point did you start to, to think that you wanted to do that as a career? Was it later? Or uh, well, I thought from the beginning that I was going to do this as a career, and my parents would say to me, well, Paul, that's wonderful, but what are you really going to do? <laughs> uh, which is a good thing to ask of a aspiring teenage artist of some kind, because the reality is, is that it isn't something that you do for a living, you know, um, not unless you're really lucky or it takes a long time. And so you are going to have to go and get jobs. Uh, and, uh, you know, hopefully in the, in the case of an, a novelist is that you're sort of learning stuff that you're going to be eventually able to, to use someday. I mean, I've never, um, I, I, I won't say who, but I've, I've definitely had a, a boss that I hated uh, who, has, who has been transformed into another character. <laughs> In, in, uh, in my novels, I'm not going to name, you know, no names, but uh, that, that so proved to be useful. So, so you're saying having a difficult experience sometimes helps in writing difficult characters or? Any experience, honestly. I never really know where I'm going to get um, little bits and pieces of ideas. Um, sometimes I, I will, uh, will have an idea for a character and won't really know what that person looks like. And then I will be in Walmart and I will spot somebody and I'm like, that's him. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So have you seen uh, Mike Bowditch? What does he look like? <laughs> I'm, I'm actually purposely um, vague about what Mike looks like because <clears throat> I want people to imagine him a little bit differently. I mean, I, I describe that he's fairly tall and, <clears throat> and some things like that. Um, but I always off, often joke, too, that Mike, he feels real to me um, as well, because uh, readers will often say that, you know, that he feels like a real person to them. And I'm like, God, I hope not. Um, <clears throat> because, you know, one day I'll be getting gas somewhere and he'll tap me on the shoulder and then punch me in the face <laughs> for what I did to him. <laughs> And you were saying earlier, uh, well, when you first came in, our photographer, Greg Reck, called you Mike 
because uh, yes. he was thinking of he was thinking of the books. He's reading the third one, um, and you said that that people write you letters and address it, Mike. Yes, they do. So um, what? How does that make? Or I don't know what. Why do you think people do that? Well, because I mean, I write in the first person, and I write um, the style of the books changes over the course of the series because I wanted it to reflect um, Mike growing up a little bit. And so his vocabulary broadens. He, he, um, but I think any of that uh, sort of brings him closer to people project him onto me or me onto him. Um, I don't know exactly, you know, why it is the way that it is, but uh, I always say that, you know, Mike is smarter than I am. He's, God knows he's braver than I am but I'm a better fisherman. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you, how, how did that come about? How did you decide to, um, you know, set a series um, against the Maine woods mm. with your main character as a, as a game warden? Because it's not something we see every day in no. mystery novels. How did that evolve, I guess, that idea for you? Well, <clears throat> knowing that I wanted to be a, a novelist, I... The biggest stumbling block for me for the longest time was that I just I didn't know anything. I mean, I, I was a, a you know a man in his twenties, which is sort of the epitome of not knowingness. <laughs> um, and uh, <laughs> then I met my 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 future wife, and she reintroduced me to the main outdoors. I was a passionate out, you know outdoors kid. Um, but she got me back out. She, her, her real love is birding. And, um, and through her, I just sort of, you know, we would explore places that we had not, neither of us had been to before. And I love, I like reading nature guides, natural history. Um, so it turns out there was something that I knew about. And that, th that thing was the main outdoors. At the same time, my wife, Kristen, was giving me contemporary mysteries to read. And I had gone to Yale where I became a snob and was looking <laughs> down my nose at anything that, you know, wasn't like a hundred, I mean, a 1500 words long with footnotes. And um, she said, these books are better than you think. And she was totally right. And in fact, as I was reading P.D. James or uh, Michael Conley or Walter Mosley or whatever, I'm like, this is actually what I want to write. I want to write books that make me want to turn the page. And specifically, I want to write a, novel, a mystery novel. So, you know, where that, the, the mystery and my only subject of expertise intersected was in the job of a game warden. Had you tried, what had you tried to write before in terms of subjects uh, and God. genres? Um, well, <laughs> lots of pretentious short stories that uh, I, I don't even, I don't even, I think I've repressed them. <laughs> <laughs> so you say that the, the subject matter was something that you knew, the outdoors. Mm -hmm. But I think of the game warden service, you know, and the, uh, um, what they do as being very specific. I mean, it's law enforcement, but right. combined with environmental science, I guess. Um, so what did you have to do, I guess, to really to, to delve into it to the level with which you could be expert at that stuff? Like, did you, did you, even before you wrote, did you have to, I don't know, talk to a certain number of game wardens or uh, do a certain number of field trips with game wardens or something? Um, initially, I, I mostly faked it. <laughs> I, uh, because I found the word and service to be pretty impenetrable. Um, there, but I had some, I did get some, some sort of help in, along the way. The, the Maine State Library for a while had this big manual that they would give to new wardens. It, was, it is about a thousand pages long. <clears throat> and it includes all kinds of really esoteric things that only you know, a warden would want to know, which is like, this is how long your sideburn can be. 
Hmm. But that that was really useful, sure. actually, for the first book because it gave me some little things that I could throw in that made it sound like I knew what I was talking about when I didn't. Um, but I, you know, I was also at that time working at Down East Magazine, and opportunities would arise to um, something would, involving the warden service would would pop up, and I'd get a chance to interview somebody. Um, there was a there was a a bear in Walderboro that was like wandering around killing pigs, and you know bears in Walderboro are, are, are not many, um, and the you know this one is choice of, of delicacy was was really weird and I don't know there was so I was always telling my my editor-in-chief that no this little thing about the game wardens I can do something with this for the magazine and he was like what what are you talking about I'm like no you'll see I'll make I'll make a, I'll do a little article about it and people will like it and so that's how I justified doing some research on the fly and so you're when Lisa introduced you, she said that you're a you're a main guide. Mm -hmm. Did you decide to be a main guide because you wanted to write about outdoor stuff, or was that separate? I would say they were they were they were intertwined. Um, I I often joke that my my getting my guide's license was going to be my fallback to if the writing didn't work out. <laughs> so, so I, I don't guide. Um, uh, it's a harder job, quite honestly, as far as I'm concerned. It's you know, it's like man, it's all this. The number of knots that you need to untie in a boat on any given day would test my patience. Um, but so it was a couple of different things. I think one of it was one thing was that I I did want to. I had written The Poacher's Son, or was still in the process of writing The Poacher's Son, and wanted to know how much I knew. And like the challenge of taking the guides test, um, uh, and you know, sort of preparing for it and that sort of thing. But you know, I have the license, I keep the license, but I, and people will approach me and say, well, what if we pay you $5,000 <laughs> to go fishing? And I'm like, I am not worth $5,000 um, for fishing. Maybe for, you know, I'll, I can, I'll, I'll give you a good reading. <laughs> but <laughs> wasn't the guide test, I think when we were talking before, you said there was something tricky. They tried to fool you on it. What was the question that, yeah. that was sort of a trick question? Oh, I'll be in trouble for this. Oh, I'm sorry. But I'm going to tell you anyway. <laughs> Just... Uh, so when I took the guide test, it's probably different now. Um, it, the, they start you with the oral exam. For me, it was two working guides and a retired game warden. And the first thing that they wanted me to do was some map and compass work and to show that I could you know, navigate. <clears throat> and they say, go over to this little table there, and you know, we want you to plot some things. And uh, can you do it? And I'm like, no, I can't do it. And like, well, why can't you do it? And I said, well, it's a metal table. And you have a compass that's being thrown off by the metal table. And that was the whole point of that little stunt was to, was to trip you up. And if you flunked that, you were done with the test at that moment. Wow. And so you didn't get to go forward. And fortunately, I did not flunk that. And is it uh, being a main guide? Is that something you have to renew, or? Yeah, but they don't retest you. As long as I don't commit a felony in right. between, <laughs> okay, I'm I'm good to go. I think for the rest of my life. <laughs> I think a lot of people, when they talk about your books, they talk about the very authentic sense of place, you know. And I've I've talked to people that have said, whether it's Machias or Rusty County. Uh, that that they feel like it's the place they recognize, the place they know that they either they grew up in or that they go to a lot. So I just wondered if you could talk about what sort of your critical, I don't know, elements, details that you feel like you need to nail to get the sense of place, especially places that you know not that many people go to, like Aroostook County. Mm. 
Um, how do you do that, I guess? Well, one of the, one of the goals with the series has been to, uh, for Maine readers or people who have you know, lived in Maine and moved away, it's really important to me that I write about a Maine that they can recognize, that you know, it feels like, I mean, because there's so many Maine books and you know, I've read plenty of them, and they're, some of them are very well written, but the, their knowledge of the people of Maine is about this deep, you know? Um, and let alone the nature of Maine. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I really, I really want to convey Maine to those people, and, and then for people who have never been here, I want to write about it so vividly that they feel like they can they can envision it, they can smell it, they can, they can see it, that sort of thing. So, so description is really important to me in the books. I mean, I try to sort of smuggle it in in different ways. Um, and then there's this question of, well, what's, what differentiates one part of Maine to another? Because, you know, if you, if you are from Maine and you travel outside the state, you realize quickly that many people think of Maine essentially in these very stereotypical terms of it, kind of just everything that's east of Route 1, you know, it's, and, um, and so to show that, hey, we have, you know, if you go to Arista County, you're going to hear an accent that's a lot closer to the upper Midwest than it is to what you might hear, you know, in Stonington um, or, you know, Frenchboro, God knows. Um, so to, con to sort of capture these, these different subcultures in Maine, which means going and hanging out. Um, you know, I like to go to any place where like the local, um, oh, anybody who's sort of in, you know, blue collar service kind of stuff, they're, they're sitting around before they go to work having, you know, greasy McMuffin type things and coffee and talking about stuff. And I will just sit there eavesdropping on them. Um, but, you know, I'll, I'll just talk about, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to people and say, well, what's the big, st what's, what is everybody arguing about here right now? You know, or who's the, who is the person I absolutely need to talk to to understand this place? And, um, and then try to schedule an interview with that person so that it, you know, the, the, I'm doing right by the area. I, I just, I would hate to feel like I've just done sort of a flyover. So it sounds like you do a, a significant amount of research of the mm -hmm. place, of actually going to the place mm -hmm. uh, and checking out the Greasy Spoon Diners and things like that. Yep. And, and several people that um, signed up to come tonight who posed questions online wanted to know about how you choose the specific places that you have set your mm -hmm. books in. And a couple wanted to know, I guess, when you're going to come to their town. Uh, <laughs> we, we had a, you really want me to come here couple, right now? We had a couple specific questions about Bangor. Bangor. Well, Mike actually works, technically, he works out of the Bangor office, but I never put him there. Um, <clears throat> uh, in the beginning, I was, to save myself lots of trouble, I was writing about locations where I'd spent a lot of time. And so, for instance, the, the, the Flagstaff Lake area, I have a friend who owned a sporting camp up there. We used to go up there all the time. Um, and so, and he was a master main guide and would tell me all kinds of great stories. And so I had a lot to work with. And then for the second book, I set it on the mid coast where I live. Um, so, you know, and the fourth book has pieces of Scarborough, which, you know, of course I knew from growing up. Eventually I reached a place where I, you know, I have not lived in that many <laughs> places. Um, so I had to do a lot more research that way. It, it, it's, it, you know, where I choose, you, it, it's usually very connected to whatever the story is that I want to tell. Um, the book that's coming out next year, God willing, is called Pitch Dark, and it's set in the Jackman area uh, because I really wanted to write about the border. Um, I have done ride-alongs with the Border Patrol, but that was a while ago, and that agency has changed since I did that. So, um, And they'll, they factor in less than in the story than you might think. But 
And how did you, or why did you want to write about the border? What about, is it, is it the border in recent years, I guess, and the, you know, after 9-11 and things like that? Or? There was a time before 9-11, well, not, not really before 9-11, but there was a time where I definitely wanted to do something on the board, set on the border because of the way that it had divided these communities. I mean, you go to Arista County and you go to, you know, Fort Kent or something, and people would just go back and forth over the bridge all day long. You know, you get gas here and you get your hair cut, cut there, and your, you know, your brother lives here and your sister lives there, and then suddenly you can't go anymore. And so for a long time, I thought I might do that, but that was a real challenging prospect. And I have to write a book a year. And so I'm like, oh my God, I'll spend you know two years researching that story. Um, and then there was this you know other chapter of the border in recent years where people were trying, instead of trying to get into Maine, they were trying to get out of Maine and get into Canada. Um, and I thought, well, maybe I'll do something with that. But I think ultimately what it came down to was just, again, the sort of reminder to people who don't know much about Maine, don't follow Maine, that, hey, we're a border state. You know, um, we have very different issues. One of the things that I think a lot of people don't know is that every Border Patrol agent, I, I believe this is still true, uh, trains on the southern border where the agency assumes that you are going to learn everything you need to know, to know about being uh, an agent. Um, and then they transfer you to Holton. Hmm. Wow. Where some of your methods um, are a little extreme. Let's put it that way. You know, you need to soften your attitudes a bit uh, towards, towards, you know, um, the the French speaking grandmother who's coming over, <laughs> yeah, <Wow. laughs> and she just wants her hair done. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you gotta lighten up, dude. <laughs> and I wonder where um, some of the things uh, in in sort of the plot points in the books mm -hmm. come from. And I was going to use the term "ripped from the headlines" because yep. it seems like sometimes. I'm just thinking of Dead Man's Wake. You know, you start with a speedboat crash. Yeah. Speedboat crashes on lakes all the time or missing people in lakes. Um, and so I just wondered, do you do you literally sort of just keep your eye out for news stories or do you – so how, how do these things come to you, I guess? Well, it's, it's a fine line for me. I mean, I've definitely there, – there's some of the books where, yeah, you read them and you say, I, I, I think I know who this is based on. <laughs> um, and it's always, in, in those cases, it's always a very public person where I don't feel like I'm exploiting them in some way. And I change those characters quite a lot so that they're not very close to um, whoever might have initially given me the idea for them. But, but yeah, there are also some stories. I mean, the boat accidents, not accidents, they're not accidents, God knows. Um, you know, I knew that I wanted to do a, a lake a big, like a, a really lake intensive book. I wanted to do a diving book about um, evidence recovery, body recovery, that sort of thing. And, you know, there have been a couple, uh, sadly, there have been a, several very big stories over the last, say, 20 years uh, in which people have died being struck by boats in different circumstances. And so, yeah, I mean, I definitely, those are cases where I might, you know, file a freedom of access request to get the entire warden case file, but I don't use the details necessarily so much as use it to to familiarize myself with, okay, who is going to have these conversations with the boater? When are they going to do it? You know, what are they going to do with the boat? You know, I mean, there's evidence on the bottom of the boat, right? There may be blood, DNA, um, it's in water. It's being washed away. Uh, the, you know, the, how quickly do they get it out of the water? Do they shrink wrap it? Do they, I mean, that, this is the thing about these sto these stories: is that one question, research question, leads to another, leads to another, and then re and then I realize only after I spent countless hours learning this stuff, like, 
you know what? I didn't really need to know that. <laughs> but does it, I would imagine it gives you a certain confidence, though, when you're writing. I mean, uh, that you know this stuff, even if you don't show it off to your readers, yeah. right? It's going to influence the confidence with which you write about certain things, I would imagine. It, 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 it genuinely does, but it makes for some very hard reading. I, I have, there's a current edition of the Maine Law Enforcement Officer's Manual, which is, I don't know, 800 pages or something, and I'm just making my way through that. It's, you know, every cop in Maine has to read it. it well, is <laughs> whether they read it or not, they're supposed to read it. Right. And so I feel like it's my duty to, to read it because it talks about how you cordon off a, a crime scene, right, which is your first responsibility. The, you know, the re first responding officer at a, at a crime you know, you see if somebody's dead, you see if somebody's injured, if they're, you know, you do certain things in those cases, but mainly what you do is you protect the scene f until such time as people who really know what they're doing show up. And because you, you put so much detail or into your research, I wondered, do you, have you gotten over the years much feedback from the Maine Warden Service at all about what they think about the books or? <laughs> I, th I think I hear from the people, I've never had a warden like call me on the phone and yell at me, um, but I, I have had wardens who are big fans, and one of the highlights of, I, uh, if, if anybody's ever not been to Rangeley, you should drive to Aquasic, which is just sort of outside downtown Rangeley, and there's the Outdoor Sported, Sporting Heritage Museum, which is just a cool little museum and for a number of years I would always do a signing there and I would have a hundred people out the door because that was like these are my peeps <laughs> um, and two to the two wardens in the area who were on duty stopped to get books signed and I was like that was just the coolest thing for me you know last year um, a new warden a re newish warden her dad bought all the hardcovers for her as a surprise Christmas gift and had me autograph them for her uh, individually, and that was such a cool thing too. So, and, and I've also met I've met young wardens who have said to me, "You know, I went to Unity because I loved your books, and I became a warden because I loved your books." Wow! <laughs> I'm like, wow. am I that old? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I I was wondering um, if Mike is, I don't know, based on, I don't know if based on anybody is the right way to phrase it, but if there are people that inspired Mike for you, either people that you knew or people that you've read about? I wouldn't say so. There was, um, I mean, Mike is, he's mostly me. I mean, but but as I said, you know, different in very key ways. Um, I did have a very, I won't, obviously name names here, but I had a a warden friend who he he was insistent. I didn't know him. He's a young warden. Um, he wanted to have lunch with me, and he reached out, and I said, sure, I'll have lunch with you. And we sat down, and he said, Paul, first I want to say, I am Mike Bowditch. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, okay, all right, well. Let's go on a ride along, and we'll see what ha what, <laughs> what happens. Um, nothing that dramatic, uh, fortunately. But at one point, he said to me, "You know, I'm." He said, "I will tell you, Paul. I've, this is a few years in." He says, "You know, all the all the stuff that Mike pulls in real life, none of it would get him fired." And I'm like, "Really? <laughs> That's scary." <laughs> wow. Uh, to contemplate. This warden was subsequently fired. <laughs> wow. And I, I wonder when you say that Mike is mostly you, why then you didn't make him as good a fly fisherman as you are? Well, I needed one area to, to, uh, that where I could... No, I, you know, it's an interesting, it was an interesting kind of thing. I, um, I mean, there, there are so many differences. I mean, certainly in terms of our... Of our uh, um, upbringing and that sort of thing. My, you know, my poor dad. My dad is a 
retired clinical psychologist, like the, the most kind, gentle man that you will ever meet. But I had friends whose fathers were just jackasses. And so, you know, that's where I was able to, 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 to find um, inspiration for Mike's father. Um, there's, yeah, I, I don't know exactly. There, there are these points of, of, of convergence and departure and um, I, but I, I guess, you know, one of the things that I, that's important is, is when I'm writing the books, I, I have this feeling that I'm writing this guy's autobiography. You know, obviously each book is meant to be sort of an exciting mystery thrillerish thing on its own but like t taken together i sort of i have this this sense that i'm charting his life uh and i think that's i think that is something that comes through in the books that this this connection that i feel towards him so people who want to see a lot more books are probably interested in the idea of charting his life because how old is he he's only he is 33 now. 33. Yeah. So how old was he when you started? You 24. Okay. We were very close together in age when I started the first book, and we're getting farther and farther apart. <laughs> which, you know, I, I, um, it's, uh, it's a better problem to have, quite honestly, than when you're a mystery writer, you meet other mystery writers. And so, for instance, I've met Michael Conley, and who does the Bosch series and Conley wanted Bosch to age in real time which means he's a really old man now you know because the character's been around for a while or or another one is uh, Dave Robichaux James Lee Burke you know Robichaux's 80 something he's still beating people up um, <laughs> so Mike has many years left is the point and you were telling me that you pick the name Bowditch from a cemetery in Searsport. So yes. how, why were you, were you looking for a name in a cemetery or how, how, did that, <laughs> no. how did that happen? This is when I was working at Down East Magazine, which required a lot of driving. And I would often drive north and I would pass, there's a cemetery on the east side of the road, which is the Bowditch Cemetery. And there's a cemetery on the west side of the road, the Gordon Cemetery. And I would see these cemeteries going by. And when I was trying to figure out what I was going to call my protagonist, I, I sort of, you know, I was looking for something that just sounded like New England, but wasn't too generic. Um, and one day that hit me as a potential name. The, the only stumbling block is it turned, it wasn't for me uh, initially, but to me, he was always Bowditch. Because I was thinking, you know, Bowditch, Bowditch like Bowden or Bowdenham or whatever. And subsequently, everybody that I've met who actually has that last name pronounces it typically like Bowditch or Bowditch. And I say to them, well, you don't want to be related to Mike anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so you were just driving by. You, didn't, you, you don't go looking in cemeteries for names. No, but I found I've I've been in cemeteries and found names. Yeah, absolutely. What but are some of the other names that you? Washburn was yeah one. Um, of course, that's a big famous main name. But uh, seeing it, you know, on a stone was like, oh yeah, I haven't used that one. <laughs> um, what would be other ones? It's important to me. The names are really important because again, I think that's you know there are places where everybody is named Pelletier. You know, and so it's like if you're gonna do if you're gonna do a, a you know a book at Aristic County, of course they might pronounce it differently, um, but the uh, you know it's like that's how you make it more real. Do you have a pronunciation guide for yourself somewhere of all these <laughs> no, name but names? I, so my friend Julia Spencer Fleming, who writes um, uh, a set of a series of mysteries that are set in upstate New York. Um, she said to me early on, she said, well, Paul, do you have a, a series Bible? And I'm like, Julia, what is a series Bible? And she says, well, it's a, a resource that you keep for yourself that tells you 
about, you know, reminds you about the characters. Like the last time they appeared, they were 53, and this is where they were working, and this is the color of their eyes, and, you know, here's a little detail that you might want to remember about them. And I'm like, Julia, I don't need this. <laughs> well, 15 novels later, uh, I have a character guide on my website. I have to update it to include Dead Man's Wake, but um, there are hundreds of characters now. And yeah, I definitely, like, if, if somebody has been off stage for a few books, I'm like, where did I leave them? <laughs> you know, what were they doing? <laughs> somebody had written to on the website, they wanted to know if, because of all the places that you write about, real or, or not, if you have a map somewhere on your wall so that you can keep all the places straight. No, I, I don't. I've, um, I tried to do one on the website at one point, and it just didn't sort of make it. But because Mike's main is, I always say that I, I prefer to use a real place for the story unless I'm going to get sued. <laughs> um, so you won't see me using lots of um, business names, typically. One big exception is the, is the McDonald's in Machias. Um, which was such a hub for, of activity when I was there that I couldn't not use it. Um, and I didn't say anything negative about it, but, but in other cases I will make up a place and you can kind of figure out if it's not a stand-in name for a specific town. You'll be able to figure out roughly, oh, it's got to be between Appleton and Union? wait a minute, no, it can't be there. It's got to be hope, you know. I try to be vague enough to, to do that, but um, no, I know where, I, I'm, I'm, I read the Gazet Bain Ga Atlas and Gazetteer for fun. And so it's like, I always buy the new edition because I want to know where the new roads are. You get the laminated one too, the <laughs> in your car? Oh, I have many copies. So it, we've talked a lot about sort of the research, mm -hmm. some of the, um, maybe less glamorous stuff because uh, I think a lot of people think of somebody as a full-time novelist mm -hmm. that you know you're at home you get up when you want you drink your coffee you make some stuff up and then you go out <laughs> to dinner um, so I wonder if you could talk about sort of what your work day is like like how much how yeah, much sure. of it is research how much of it is writing how much of it is, is yeah. something else um, one of the things, I, I learned a few, few really important lessons for myself. One was that, uh, I mean, being a former journalist, I, I can write on command. I can sit down and just start. But it doesn't mean that it's very good. Uh, I've learned that I need to write outside of my house. I, I can't write at home. It's too um, cluttered <laughs> is, the, is the, real, the real reason my office is, is a mess. Um, so I need to, like, rent another office, which I can then turn into a mess. Uh, but I like the, I just like going to work. I like, I like the feeling of going to a space where I'm just going to write. And it is not, you know, it's not a cabin in the woods. It's never been, you know, a beach house or anything. Those are f for the movies. Uh, it's, it is very workaday for me. I mean, I, I wish that my, you know, Hemingway used to get up, well, he had, he was an insomniac and he drank too much and so he would wake up early in the morning and he would stand at his desk and write for a few hours and then he would be done by noon so he could go marlin fishing and continue his <laughs> drinking. And, you know, it's one of the reasons why we have this idea in our head, well, you know, it's like, well, Paul, where's your marlin fishing for the day? Um, so, but my peak hours of writing are really about nine to three, and I wish that that was not the case. I wish it was like early in the morning or late at night or whatever, rather than being like at the heart of the day. But it's, um, you know, it's staring at the computer. I try to, a lot of my research, I read things in the evenings or after I'm done. I answer emails in the evenings. Um, and I try, when I have time, I try to do, you know, I'll try to, to work in, say, one kind of research conversation a week, um, a lunch with somebody, or, you know, sometimes I have to get in the car and drive somewhere and stay over for a while, that kind of thing. 
And as the series goes on, have you found the ideas harder to come by or maybe easier because you're you're so into it now into 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 the subject matter writing a series there's a lot there is something that's easier about it because i know i write from mike's point of view so i know a lot about mike i know what he sounds like i know the supporting characters those are all things i don't have to start to make up at the beginning which somebody like lily king for instance you know when lily writes a book it's everything is a blank slate to start. You know, I don't envy her that. The writing a series though also does tie your hands to some degree. And um, and so you have to learn, you know, work within the confines of what you've written before. And the fact that of course that I am writing about game wardens and this sort of thing. I would say though, as far as whether it's easier or harder, that um, it depends on the book. Honestly, there have been some that uh, have just have been very difficult and and turned into good books. Um, but very often, the ones that are the the easiest are the best books because they just seem to want to tell themselves the stories. Well, I think we we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. Is that right? Strawberry or somebody? <laughs> well, Ray, you have the handheld mic, so we won't have a handheld mic to pass around. To oh, so if you... I could just hand this. You're well, right, because you wouldn't be able to. Yeah. Let me just see if anybody has a Grab that from you. Yep. Hi, Pelletier here. <laughs> and this is a B show. Next oh, man. <laughs> uh, are you considering any other type of story without Mike Bowditch, like a new character? I, I would say that I'm open to doing a different story. Um, the problem is, is that, you know, there isn't a character in my vast universe of, of Mike Bowditch characters that I would spin off necessarily because they're so close to the stories that I'm already telling. Um, next week I'm doing a Zoom conversation with my friend Tess Gerritsen, who you know has done lots of books. Uh, the Rizzoli and Isles, of course, made it into the long-running series. But she has a new series that she's just starting uh, the first book is called The Spy Coast, and it's based on this premise, which may or may not be true, that the Camden area is h historically a hot spot for retired CIA agents. <laughs> and, and Tess picked up on this and said, oh, I can do something with this. And I'm so mad at her because it's like, <laughs> oh, that was the one I could have done. Uh, but she got there first. But so anyway, she and I are going to be talking uh, on Zoom next week. So uh, about that book. If you put up your hand, I'll come to you. I love your books, but I have a request. Okay. <laughs> Please don't let Mike fall into the water again in the winter. <laughs> that really bothers. <bothered. laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think if I've already violated your <laughs> in the new book. <laughs> I may have. Um, no, I have not. Uh, yeah, I've been so hard on the guy. It's really, it's really, I, I, the, the, I used to joke that, that um, I had a pretty rough and tumble life myself. And uh, so many of Mike's injuries are ones that I myself have experienced. Um, but uh, I've not yet been, I've not yet fallen beneath the ice and not gotten out. No. I've, I've, not, <laughs> I've not been stabbed. I've not been shot. But, you know, the evening's young. Um, you mentioned the community of writers, and I think it's great that you've 
um, done so. Is there a, a specific book or author that you always go to as a must buy, must read for you? What's on your reading list? Oh yeah. Um, well, it would, you know, sort of depends on what it is. Um, I'm a big fan these days of uh, J.K. Rowling's uh, Robert Galbraith crime novels. I like, I, I, I like that they're big books. I always want to write a big book, but I can't. Nobody will let me. Um, but I, I, I don't know. They're sort of soapy, but that's okay. I, uh, who else will I read? Sort of regularly. I. Um, you know, in, in terms of like nonfiction, there will be, uh, if Bern Heinrich is writing about Maine, I will read Bernd's book. Um, I don't, I think it often depends on, on the, the book. I, I, one of the things that really trips me up a lot is that I can't read fiction while I'm writing a book. And since I'm writing a novel almost all the time, my my mystery reading period gets squished, and um, and the reason I can't write a, a I just if if the book is bad if, if it's a bad mystery I can't focus on it because I begin to think about my own book, and if it's a good mystery I start to imitate it when I sit down, and um, or even it doesn't even have to be a mystery. I went through a Faulkner phase this summer of all things. I hadn't read Faulkner since college. And my sentences just got longer and longer and longer. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute, Paul. <laughs> Enough with the Faulkner. Um, can you talk about your choice to show Maine in a very unvarnished way? Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the things I've appreciated about your books is that uh, you kind of get down to the nitty-gritty of a lot of the communities. Talk about that. Sure. Um, boy. I had a great career at Down East Magazine. <laughs> but, you know, the Down East Magazine that I, I started working for was one that was, you know, put a very positive face on the state of Maine. And I was proud to work there. I think it was reflective of the best of Maine. But as somebody who grew up in Maine, uh, is from Maine, I have relatives who have lived very different lives. Um, I've seen, you know, trailer, I've been in trailers, plenty of trailers. Um, and I just felt a real need to, to write about the Maine that wasn't gonna be in Down East, you know? Uh, it was closer to my main, despite the fact that I went to Yale. You know, I, I ended up meeting the people who own the summer houses, you know, um, and socializing with them too. And I, I, you know, and my dad was the first person in his family to go to college. So like Mike, I think I am a child of the two mains. You know, I, I was fortunate to, to be to re receive a very good education, but sort of culturally, I'm still closer to some of my extended family in, in terms of how I see see things. I appreciate. You. Thank you. I just wanted to make a comment. I've enjoyed your Facebook page, and oh, thank yeah, you. and. And I can't remember when it was or what the book was, but you put a question out there because Danny Pelletier had arrived onto the scene and you wanted to know who Mike should end up with, Danny <laughs> or Stacy. <laughs> and being a wannabe writer myself who wouldn't have the slightest idea, I answered that question, boy, and I told you exactly why. <laughs> he should be with Stacy, so he could grow, he, but he had to grow up first and all this stuff. And so I was just really happy to see that he ended up with Stacy. <laughs> oh, oh I'm so not. sorry. Or not. Or not. Because I'm not all the way through. <laughs> and then the other thing I just wanted to say is um, you had just made a comment about wanting to write a longer book. And every mm -hmm. time I finish one of your books, 
I'm longing for more of that book. Yeah. I always feel really sad because it feels short to me. Yeah. And so why can't you write a longer book? <laughs> <laughs> oh, because I, I keep signing these contracts that say write a book a year. I know. I can't believe you. I'm so happy you're doing it. And I'm just, I've tried. I've tried to be, you know, to work at the Stephen King pace. Oh, and no, it, no, no. it just doesn't work for me. Um, but just to, just I want to just say something a little bit about your your comment about the yeah it was sort of a strange thing for me just to float a question like that on my Facebook page to readers like oh what do you want to have happen because I didn't feel bound by what you said <laughs> um, and uh, but uh, being a, a, a writer in this day and age where you know people leave reviews on Amazon. Or Goodreads or whatever. If you are an, uh, a new writer, never read your Amazon reviews. Um, you know, but the reality is, is that every you know, readers. There's a wisdom among readers, and I find that I usually, I while I will not read the comments and the reviews and things, over time I will get the message, right. And so, for instance, one of the most popular characters in the series is Mike's wolf dog, Shadow. Shadow was supposed to be like a one and done. You know, he was going to appear in Widowmaker, and then I just sort of released him into the wild at the end of Widowmaker, and he wasn't coming back. But everybody kept, as soon as I wrote that character, it was like, when's Shadow coming back? When's Shadow coming back? And I'm like, well, he's not coming back. Because I'm the author, and I'm saying he's not coming back. <laughs> but after a while, you know, I'm thinking, well, maybe I could find a way. And what would that do? And and the the the, the real what I saw was he was actually going to be the vehicle. You know, like before Mike could have a woman in his life, like a really woman, a real woman in his life, he needed a dog. <laughs> He needed like to train first to like take care of something, to have that level of a relationship, you know. And uh, um, so, yeah, it's, stuff comes. Stuff definitely comes back. Uh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. You are writing an autobiography. I mean, I can't wait to see how it's like. Hi, Paul. Hi. So, I speak from experience when I say this that. I think all of us who spent all of us spent uh, our lives in deep in the Maine woods. I think we all know a Charlie Stevens, yeah. or at least an extract of. Right. So I was just curious, where did your Charlie Stevens come from? Um, my my Charlie Without is giving he, too much away. No, no, it's fine. Um, so Charlie is more of an amalgam of a bunch of. I've been fortunate in my life. I don't know what it is about me, but. Like as a young man and a middle-aged man, I seem to like to. There's this. Uh, I don't. I don't know what it. What it is. Zen saying. You know, it's like when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. That's been the story of my life. I have been such a messed up. I was such a messed up young man, and these these older, wiser men would sort of appear in my life, and be, would be like, "We need to straighten you out a little bit, Paul." And so, um, you know, and then also like Charlie, for instance, bears a lot of resemblance to the late Jack McPhee, chief warden pilot, at least in terms of the externalities of his life. But um, Charlie was inspired by my friend John Cole, who was the founder of the Maine Times and just a, an incredible fisherman. Um, he was a tail gunner in World War II, flew the full complement of missions over Germany. Um, He's he's inspired by you know my friend who's a master man guide. He's a friend by inspired by a friend of mine who's a wildlife biologist. Uh, there's just a, there's just I've been very fortunate, as I said, to have these mentors, and I knew it was what Mike needed, just as I needed them. Um, and and it's amazing I, what you're saying about some of the characters. It's like yeah, I know a Billy Cronk. You know, or I know, yeah, definitely, I know Charlie Stevens, and so magic of what <laughs> I don't know if it's magical, but I'm glad that it feels that way. And this will be our last question back here. 
Oh boy, the pressure's on. So, so, so this, you, you may not either want to or be able to answer this, um, but you said you have a contract that calls for one book a year. Mm -hmm. How long does the contract go, Paul? Uh, <laughs> so, the, so Pitch Dark, the book that's coming out next June, and I can say with some confidence now that it will come out next June. If, if, if we had had this event like three weeks ago, before my editor read it, I might have had a different answer, but he loves it. Uh, it will get published on schedule, you know, as long as every, the world doesn't go to flames. Um, so that is actually the second book in a three book contract. So there's one more that I'm contracted for beyond that. And uh, I'm not bored with Mike is the thing. People always want me to write something else. And I'm like, well, I would if I wanted to. Like, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's it. It's, it's, it's like if I feel like I, there's something new, more I have to say about the character, I just want to, I, I, I enjoy writing that character. You know, it, I don't enjoy the pressure of writing a book a year, but, um, but, I seem to be holding up <laughs> and, uh, and it's just, I mean, it's, I, I you know, I, I really, I want to thank, um, you know, the press Herald and for having me here for this. I want to thank the sponsors for doing this event. Uh, thank you, Lisa, for the introduction. Thank you, Ray, for interviewing me. And thank you most of all to everybody for coming out tonight. I mean, when you do public events, you just never know what you're going to get. And, and I'm like, oh my God, you know, are there going to be like five people at this? <laughs> and, and it's like, it's sold out. It's like, this is going to, this is going to keep my ego going for a good <laughs> few days, you know, at least. <laughs> so, th so thank you so much for, for, for coming to this. Thank you.